Welcome, find a seat, find a seat, there you go. Oh, it's, uh, you know, I had this, I had this thought this morning, it's just, it is so good to have some connection, isn't it? Connection that isn't like just about business, but taking a few moments to have some face-to-face. I was remembering this past week and some time away that Diane and I had over in Sisters, um, reflecting on that season when COVID swept through uh, the, not just our nation, the world, and so much of our lives was changed. And one of the things that was radically changed was the way in which we interact with one another and the kind of contact that we can have. And I'm just so, I'm really thankful this morning to be here and to be with you and to be with the Lord. I invite you to pray with me. I'm going to pray, so I guess I'm not inviting you to speak. I'm just inviting you to agree with me in prayer as we welcome the Lord into our midst. Lord Jesus, you said that um, whenever your disciples gathered in the future, after you left them, after you ascended to heaven, you said, every time you gather in my name, even if it's just two, I'll be amongst you. Well, Lord, you know that we're more than two this morning. So we're thankful that you're faithful to your promises, that you would be with us. Lord, we, we welcome you into this place. Holy Spirit, we welcome you as the teacher to the church. You know how to speak our language. You know how to speak to us in ways that we can understand. So even as we sing songs of worship to you, even as we read the scripture this morning, Holy Spirit, we're listening for your voice and trusting that you will speak to us in a way that we can understand. Heavenly Father, we give you honor this day. We are the people of your pasture. We are yours. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you as the one true God. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. Hallelujah. You know, everything is set. The Holy Spirit is here. God is here. God is looking down. God is ready to move. The only thing that is missing is our hearts being perfected in his presence. We're going to sing a song later calling down the, uh, the kingdom of God to have his will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven and to start in our hearts. And as we allow ourselves to individually come close and focus on God, let us stand together right now, if you are able to. And if you are not able to stand, allow your heart to come together in unity with all of us today. Because we are, as one voice, going to call on our one Savior. Walk in your power, Lord. I want to walk. I want to walk in your power, Lord. Sing it to him. Oh, I want to walk in your peace, in your peace. So let us be one, just as you are one with us. Oh, I want to walk in the spirit. I want to walk, I want to walk in your power, Lord, oh, I want to walk in your peace, oh, here's the unity part, let us be one, just as you are one with us, oh, I want to walk in the spirit of the Lord, Lord, let these come on. 
about the Lord's Prayer, but I thought it would be really good if we just said it together as we honor him this morning. Let's say the words are up there if you don't remember or sometimes they change different different people say it different ways, but we will say it the way this is written today. And uh, just join with me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Let's clap to the Lord. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be louder. There we go. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here, here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. Thank you. 
you sit down while we sing this next song or you sing it with us but I was at a concert last night up north and the congregation was jam packed I was thinking wow that would be really nice if we had that crowd um, and at one point they all turned on their lights their flashlights on their phones and it was amazingly beautiful and I felt like the Lord said, just wait. Just wait until you see the lights of home. And that's going to be so majestic and so amazing. And when we talk about who the king is today, let's welcome him. Let's welcome the love that he has for us. He has set us free. He's ransomed us. We are free, and I'm a child of God. Yes, I am.
Uh, thank you, friends, for leading us in that. I want to make a comment about the essence of that last song that we just sang. That's about identity. That song is about identity. And our world is, and our country, has a lot of turmoil around all sorts of issues of identity. Political identities, national, citizenship. But what we just sang there is the truth that comes out of what the Lord wants to do when he calls his creation to himself. When the creator, the one who spoke us into existence, and you might think, my mom and dad spoke me into, spoke me into existence. Well, without the Lord, none of us are here. He, he is the creator God. And when that creator God calls to us, He's calling to us to be his children. That, that's an identity issue. And so when we sing, I'm a child of God, yes I am. For those who are followers of Jesus Christ, that identity is core. And, and that will be the identity that we take with us when these earth suits wear out. I hate to be a bummer on you, but some of you are already having Advil for dessert. <laughs> so you know that these bodies wear out. What happens after that? I have a friend, and, and his, his best idea currently is that when he dies, that's it. That's it. There's just no more. But the one who created the body and breathed life into us and gave us, each one of us, a soul would say, this isn't all that there is. There's something more. And what is, what is that? There, there's an, a longing and an echo of the Creator within each one of us. It's an echo of eternity. And everyone, this world is so loud and so busy and sometimes so contentious that it can drown out the echo of eternity. Uh, that the Lord is, but He said, I, I want you as my children. And so that's what happens when somebody decides to step off of the throne of their life, the place of authority, and relinquish it to the one who gave life, to the Creator. When that happens, this is what the Lord does. He gives us a new name. The followers of Jesus are called Christians. It, what it meant in the Old Testament was little Christs. It, it, it wasn't a compliment, by the way. It was meant as a insult. You're just little Christs. You're just followers of that rabbi Jesus. Yes, we are. He gives us his name, and he gives us life and, and victory over the grave. So for any of you that are followers of Jesus, when your body ceases to function, and that would be what we would call in this life death, Jesus says, I'll give you life again. Life eternal. That's where our identity is wrapped into. I'm a child of God, what we just sang. It doesn't mean that these earthly identifications that we have don't have meaning they do. I'm a Minnesota Viking fan. That has some meaning. Not for you, it doesn't. But for me, it does. But beyond the joke, certainly our citizenship matters, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But it does not supersede our identity 
of the one that we follow if you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're not, and I know there are those that are watching as well with us online, I invite you to consider this. What would my life be like if I were to step out of the place of authority, that, that place that it's like a, a kingly throne to step off of that and say to God, I relinquish this to you. What would your life be like? That's the journey. That's the journey. Those are the things that we talk about as we gather together. How do we do that? What, how do we follow the Lord and not say, you know what, I want back into the chair. How do we do that? That's not even the sermon. That right there. That's not even the sermon. Ushers, would you come and serve us? I want to say as, as we have this time of uh, worship uh, by the giving of tithes and offerings, this is for those that consider Living Hope Church their home church. If you don't have a home church, we encourage you to find one. But if, if it's for those who say we're going to give to the Lord and to the ministry through this church. Lord, we thank you for the way that you provided for us as we do this. We do it in, in hopes of honoring you and being your hands and feet in a world that needs you. Give us wisdom, Lord, to know how best to use these funds to meet needs around us. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you worship. Diane, would you uh, come come forward? And Debbie, you're going to have a chance. I know, there you are. You get a chance. to. I, there's a couple things that, uh, ladies, I would like you to be aware of opportunities here in the fellowship. And so my bride gets to go first. Good morning. So, um, yeah, I wanted to make sure we had it in the e-news. And I put something on the women's Facebook thing. Hold it up. And um, coming up in September on a Saturday, there's a one-day conference for women called Up, In, and Out. And it says it's a women's leadership conference, but it's um, geared really to, if, if you have a heart for loving the Lord with your whole heart and wanting to share his love with others, then you would consider it a leader. And you can come, it's for all, any woman that wants to come and grow closer to the Lord. It's one day at Alder State Camp, our Free Methodist Camp in Turner, Oregon. We'll plan to have from here. Um, that's Saturday the 28th. And um, yeah, if you have more questions, talk with me about it. It's just, it's like from 9.30 to 3.30, so I'm sure we'll be here eight, eight maybe or so. So it's just one day and $25, very, very reasonable with lunch. So just wanted to make sure I put a plug in for it and be sure to talk with me about it. Okay, um, give the date again. When is it? September 28th, ladies, we'll uh, let you know about it again. We'll put out a sign-up sheet, so if you would like to be a part of this. Yeah, actually talk with me because we, we sign up online, each individual person. Talk with so. Diane. There you go. Okay, thank you. And Pastor Debbie? Here you go. Ladies, another opportunity to be built up in your faith in Christ. Yes. We're going to start a study called 12 Women of the Bible. It will be Tuesday mornings at 10 here in, um, at the church. I'm going to prepare a special place for us to meet. So come and enjoy that. Um, some of the women, I'm just going to give you a little preview here. Um, Eve, finding lasting contentment in the truth. Another one is Abigail, D. 
dealing with confrontations in relationships. Another one is Mary Magdalene, transforming from outcast to followers. That's just three of the women that we will be looking at. I invite you to come. The books are available. You do not have to have a book. They're a little bit under $10. I think they're about $9.56 and um, with, post, with postage. <laughs> and you don't need to buy a book. Uh, they're nice to have. And you don't need to commit to all 12 weeks. Each week is an individual lesson. And you will get blessed by hearing about that one specific woman during that week. So we start September 17th. It goes for 12 weeks. It meets Tuesdays at 10. Thank you. Okay, and if the ladies want to sign up, there's a sign up out in the lobby. There is. There is. Okay, ladies, there's a couple of opportunities for you uh, to be built up in your faith in Christ and have fellowship. And also, uh, the church meets uh, again Wednesday night. We meet in the fellowship hall for a Bible study at 6.30, so it, all are welcome. That is not um, just women only. Uh, we will begin this coming week a study through the Gospel of Mark. So if you want to join us when the church is gathering midweek, we'll be gathering in the fellowship hall 6.30 Wednesday night. Okay. I want to tell you a couple of stories. The first story is a story from my own life. The stories that, that we're going to cover, either the one I tell you or the one we read about, fall into the category of encounters with God. I've had some encounters with God, and some people might think, well, that's something. I don't know if it's an encounter with God. So it's left up to uh, the interpretation of the hearer, I guess. But this is a personal account for me. It's one of the very uh, foundational experiences that I've had with God. I, I would like to tell you that I hear from Him and I see Him and I have these foundational experiences every day of my life. That hasn't been my journey. When I was 16 years old, my family moved from Missoula, Montana. But not my family, my mom and dad and I, my three older brothers, they abandoned me and stayed in Missoula. They didn't move when I had to move with my parents. No, I got to move with my parents. It was a privilege to move with my parents. As I was about to start my junior year in high school, and I went to this public high school, 2,600 students for three grades. The graduating class that I was going to be in was 850 of my closest friends who I didn't know. Great Falls High, home of the mighty bison. True, that's the name of the... You've seen the pictures of people in Yellowstone thinking bison are friendly animals? and then you see that person hurtling through the air because they find out that a bison isn't a friendly animal. Well, I went to Great Falls High. Didn't know a soul. I had gone to church most of my life, but I was, as it were, lukewarm and on the fence. It depended where I was for who I was. I was fractured. I was a different person in all sorts of different circumstances. When I was playing baseball, I was different than when I was going to church on a Sunday morning, than when I was at school, than when I was hanging out with my friends after school. I was, there were a bunch of different Sean's. And I met a guy named Brandon. Brandon's parents were missionaries in Ecuador, and they were home for a little while to raise funds before they went back to Ecuador. And he was sitting in my history class, U.S. history, and he said, we got to know one another. He was the first guy that I knew in Great Falls, and he said, uh, do you go to church? And I said, yeah, I, I go to church. Do you want to go to my church? Sure. 
yeah, I'll go to your church. And that was what I started doing. I started going to church with Brandon because he had invited me. And one day at the Great Falls Evangelical Church, I'm sitting in where, similar to what you're doing right now, sitting, and as the pastor was speaking, I started having, uh, I don't know if it was a conversation or an experience, but he was talking about the Holy Spirit and the interaction of the Holy Spirit of God with someone who is open to making that surrender that I talked about earlier, about getting out of the place of authority in your own life and surrendering it to God's control. He was talking about that, and as he talked, I imagine, I could see in my mind's eye, you, do you have a mind's eye? What, what you can imagine? Here's what I could see in my mind's eye. That I was like a tire with an inner tube in it, and that inner tube was filling up, like when a tire fills up. That, that's the old tires, right? Now they're just different. And I could see, like, I was like, wow, I, there's this inner tube inside of me blowing up. And it, this is the conclusion I came to. Is that what it's like to have God in you? I, I wasn't sure. I was 16. I was right on the front edge of, of learning about who God was. And, and, and I knew that I wanted God in my life and that I had asked Him to take authority and control in my life. And then, as I thought about that, I thought about where I'd been the night before. Uh, I won't go into details, but it wasn't church. And my parents didn't know where I'd been, and there were things going on there that were not legal. And I thought, whoa. Did I, did I take God there? Did, did He go with me? And I started feeling, the, the nice word is conviction. The other word is really bad. Like I started to almost sweat. Like, oh my goodness, you, like I'm talking to God, you were there? And I, I don't remember a conversation with God, but as I reflect on that and, and the things that I'm learning about God, He was there. He, he was there. We know from the Scriptures, from what David writes in the Scriptures, there's nowhere that we go or could go that God isn't there. As David describes it in Psalm 139, I could go to the edge of the known world, to the four corners, to the depths. Even there, your spirit will be with me. I didn't have those scriptures in my mind. I just had this idea of, you know, God's in me. Oh my goodness, I took him to a place I don't think he wanted to go. And you might think, that's really weird, Sean. Yes, it is. But God was speaking to me in a way that I could understand him. And it was a start. It was the next conversation with God. And since that time, I've been trying, sometimes with great focus, other times with, as my mom would say, a lack of focus. I've been trying to see God or hear God. And I've been relying on this thought. If He made me, 
then he knows how to talk to me in a way I can understand him. So you have a language, and I'm not talking about English or Spanish or maybe, if you're real fancy, French or Latin, but the language by which you understand the world and who God is. When I say God knows your language, he knows how to speak to you in a way you can understand, in a way that I can understand, he knows that language. David writes in one of his psalms that before, even before I have a thought, you know what I'm thinking and what I'm going to say, which is a little freaky if you, you know, like that old song, he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, that Santa's a creeper, but God in order to be qualified for the position of God, you have to know everything. And you have to be able to be everywhere, even to that place that I took the Lord that night before church. Everywhere. So that was an encounter in my life. I've had many, but that's a really significant one. And I'm going to ask you just quietly to to ask yourself this question. Have you ever encountered God? And if so, I want to say, don't dismiss that. That's important. Those are important things in our life the Creator making Himself known to His creation. So, that said, I want to look this morning at the life of somebody who's had many encounters with God. Many. His name was Moses. Here's the real quick backstory on Moses before we get to that Scripture. Hang on. Moses was born to Jewish parents, Hebrews. And his parents were living in Egypt at a time when his people, the Egyptians, were slaves. His people, the Hebrews, were slaves to the Egyptians. And they were growing in number massively. And the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, got worried that that group of people is going to outnumber us, and so we've got to do something. And he came up with this maniacal idea that every baby boy that's born to the Hebrews will just kill him at birth. So that will keep their population down. That, that's maniacal. But Moses' mom, who was just before she was ready to give birth, gave birth without Moses coming to harm, but she knew that her boy was going to be in peril, so they built this like little raft basket, put this baby in the basket, covered it over, put it in the Nile River. It was their best chance of life for this child. That's how bad things were. If that's your best option to keep your baby alive. But they put the baby in the basket and down the river. And here's the story. The Pharaoh's daughter was just down the river, sees a basket floating, has the basket retrieved. There's a child in it. She makes the decision to raise the child as her own. Wow. Is that not an interesting turn? that her father who has deemed that all of these Hebrew baby boys are to be killed, now has a Hebrew baby boy being raised in his own palace by his daughter. God knows how to rescue. 
And He knows how to rescue us too. It's not like He's forgotten how to rescue. So Moses grows up in the palace of the Pharaoh. He's educated. By the time he's 40, he's becoming a leader, but he's aware of his Hebrew heritage. And he sees that in his lifetime, the Hebrews have been put more and more under the thumb of the oppressive Egyptian rule as slaves. And he sees an Egyptian slave master beating a Hebrew one day, and he steps in to confront him, and in the confrontation, he hits the man and kills him. The next day, he sees two Hebrew slaves arguing, and he tries to step in to a place of leadership before he's been prepared for it. And they know that he killed one of the Egyptian slave masters. And they're not having any of him settling their dispute. And one of them says, you're going to kill me the way you killed that Egyptian slave master? And and Moses knew that the gig was up. If they know what happened, then everybody's going to know. And he he, in fact, the Pharaoh did know that he had murdered an Egyptian slave master. And so he took off at age 40, he runs. He leaves his people, he leaves his country, he ends up in Midian, and he gets married. And his wife's father has flocks, and he becomes a shepherd. And for 40 years... He's a shepherd in his father-in-law's back 40. And then at age 80, you think you're old? Age 80. He's got his father-in-law's sheep out in the desert, kind of feeding. He sees a bush, not unusual, but the bush is on fire and the bush is not being consumed. And he says to himself, you can find this story in Exodus chapter 3, he says to himself, well, why isn't that bush being consumed? I should go over and see it. And it says right there in Exodus chapter 3, when God saw that he had captured he went to him. And it's not that scripture yet either. I'll get there. God captured Moses' attention. And you know what happened? He had an encounter with God. And in that encounter, God spoke to him in a way that he understood, but he said that he didn't like. How do you respond when someone tells you something you don't like? This happened to me all of the time because I had three older brothers. But you don't need older brothers to hear things you don't like. By the way, they heard things they didn't like from their younger brother. Moses hears God say to him, I've seen the oppression of my people. I've heard their cries. I'm going to rescue them, and you're the dude. What? Yeah. You're going to lead them out of their slavery. You know, with a, with a Robert De Niro accent. Are you, you talking to me? Yes, you. And that's when Moses starts backpedaling. He understands, this is God talking to me. It was God who was represented by the fire in the bush, but the bush wasn't, wasn't being consumed. As he approached it, God said, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. Moses understood, this is God, and he's speaking to me, and he's telling me he's going to use me to free the the Hebrews from their slavery? It goes for about three chapters of, yes, I am. You can't be serious. I'm serious. You really can't be serious. No, I'm serious. 
It goes a little differently than that, but that's the gist. That's an encounter. From that point on, Moses has encounter after encounter with God. He does, by God's hand and help, lead the Hebrews out of slavery to, if you've heard the story, to the promised land. They, they get out of the grip of Pharaoh and his army, miraculously. They're provided with food in the desert, miraculously. They're, they're thirsty. They're about to die of thirst. God provides them water from a rock, miraculously. He has encounter after encounter. He goes up onto a mountain that God has called him up to, to meet with him. He goes up for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know how this happened. I just read this this last week. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I can go about 40 minutes and I need a granola bar. 40 days and 40 nights. This guy has had encounter after encounter with God. A little different than mine. Much more it's in the Bible and mine isn't. But it, it was real for him as much as mine was for me. Two, maybe three times, Moses was on that mountain in the presence of God for 40 days where he didn't eat anything. The last time he came down from this experience with God, he wasn't aware of it, but when he came back down into the camp of the Israelites, which by the way would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of at least a million and a half people, it wasn't just a little camping group. His face was glowing, they, it says in the Scriptures. His face was glowing, and it freaked the people out. And so they asked him to wear a veil because he had the greatest suntan of all time. I don't know what it was, but it, it was different than them. After he had been in the presence of the Lord and fasting and seeking the Lord and hearing, the, hearing from the Lord. All of those experiences bring us to this story that we're about to read. So, now we can go to the Scripture. This is from Exodus chapter 33. This is somewhere in the neighborhood of about two years after they have gotten free from the slavery of the Egyptians, that the Egyptians held over them. And before we read this, I want to pray and I invite you to pray with me. God, would you speak to me in a way that I can understand you? I pray that you would speak to my friends here too in ways that they can understand you. And Lord, if it's your desire today to encounter us, we're listening and watching for you. Give us courage to follow. Amen. Exodus 33, starting in verse 7, this continues the story of Moses. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it, set it up some distance from the camp. By the way, that God had given Moses instructions about how to build this tent, this tabernacle, and, and use that as a place to meet with him. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrance of their own tents. They would all watch Moses as he disappeared inside. They're used to him going and listening for God and talking to God. He'd gone up on the mountain several times for weeks at a time to be with God. As he went into the tent, 
the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at the entrance while, God, while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Just let that sink in. Here's a guy who's gone into a tent and there's this miraculous pillar of cloud and the people have come to understand that that's not God, but, but it represents God's presence. That guy has just gone into the tent where that pillar of cloud is over. And it says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, that doesn't mean he didn't have a father, that means his dad's name was Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. By the way, this young guy, Joshua, when Moses would pass away in the years to come, guess who God chose to be the next leader? Joshua, the guy who's hanging out at the tent. One day Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me. Now, don't lose, the, don't lose that this is another encounter. We're going to read about another encounter that Moses had with God. You've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land but you haven't told me who you will send with me. You have told me I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If that's true, that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, but wouldn't you like to be like a fly? Well, not eavesdrop on this conversation. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. But Moses now knows I've got these people, and there's a lot of them, and I'm supposed to lead them somewhere, and I have no idea how I'm going to do that, or who's going to go with me to help me. And God says, I'll go with you. Everything will be fine. That doesn't mean that God gave him all of everything that he is going to need all at once. Have you wished, God, I wish I had more information. And then sometimes you get it and you think, it's too much, God, too much. It's a, a fire hydrant. Just give me a little. So he, he says, he doesn't give it all to him, but he says, I'll be with you. I'm going to personally go with you. It'll be fine. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. As I read this, I've read this over and over. I'll go with you. Listen, if you don't go with us, are your ears painted on? Because I just said, I'm going to go with you. But, but you can tell that Moses is nervous. He's anxious. Who's going to go with us? I'll go with you. But if you don't go with us, I'll go with you. If you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. You know why? Because God was there. Moses is learning this, this truth. Wherever God is, that's the best place for me. I'm 63 and I'm still learning this lesson. You'd think, one time's enough. I, I just need one time to learn that particular lesson. 
But man, my, my self-will is so strong at times. Do you ever want to say to the Lord, hey Lord, come on over here, this is where we're going. I'm asking God to follow me. And I still do it at times. Then I read this and I think, well, he was so silly. Oh, I'm made of the same stuff as he is. The Lord replied to Moses, verse 17, I will indeed do what you have asked for. I will indeed do what you've asked. For I looked favorably on you, and I know you by name. But just as a side note, do you think God knows your name? Do you think he knows your name? Even your middle name. Man, I didn't like telling people my middle name. Patrick. I got called Sean Sean the Leprechaun. So what do you think they were going to do when they found out it was Sean Patrick? I, I didn't like my name. But here's something else that I've been learning since those days in Great Falls when I was a teenager. I've been learning that he does know my name. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say something, whether you, you may not agree with it, but I think he knows your whole name. He knows you. And here, here's something else. I think that God looks favorably on you. And you might think, you don't know me. Have you ever had the thought, if people really knew who I was, they wouldn't like me? And some are like, Sean, nobody likes you anyway, dude. No, 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 but you know what I mean. When, when, when we're wondering about our identity, what does God really think of me? And the first thing that might come to your mind is something that you're ashamed of or you don't want anybody else to know. And I just told you, he knows everything. So put it together. If God knows, it, knows your name and knows everything about you and me, you're telling me he looks on me with favor? I'll go beyond that. God looks on you and me with love. Love. Sometimes the way God looks on us is different than the way we look on Him or on others. I'll bring this to a close here. Verse 17, it said, I will indeed do what you have asked, I will look favorably on you. I know you by name. Moses responded, Then show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, Now get this, when Moses says, Show me your glorious presence, he's seen some amazing things. He's seen a pillar of fire that God put between, him, between his people and the Egyptians. He's seen God in the pillar of cloud. He's had God talk to him face to face. And now he's saying, let me see your glorious presence. Can I just ask one more thing? Verse 18, show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name Yahweh before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. And you might think, why is God so egotistical? You can't look at my face. Well, what about this? If I've been right, and I said that God looks on you and me with love, would it be loving if he knew that 
we would die if we saw him face to face. Holiness, pure and unadulterated, per perfect holiness of God. I don't want you to die. And so he says this, you can't look on my face and live. Look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face you will not see. I'm not sure what the Spirit is saying to you this morning. We prayed, maybe you prayed with me, Lord, speak to me in a way that I can understand. But I'm going to conclude with this thought. God sees you and me. God knows your name and my name. God looks on you and me with loving favor. If we will, if we want to, we can relinquish the place of authority in our life to that God. But you and I were created with, here's the $64,000 word, free moral agency. God gave to us something that He hasn't given to some of His other creation. Choice. If you choose, if I choose, I can step aside and give God that place of authority. Why would we be created with this gift? of choice. It's different than with animals who have instinct. But I know this, whether we choose to step aside and allow Him to have authority in our life, that doesn't change His knowledge of us or His tender thoughts toward us. But it does change the course of our life when we choose to follow Him in this life and the next. It's an invitation. As I'm reading and rereading about these encounters that Moses had with God, I see at, it seems like at every turn, God is giving him yet another opportunity Will you follow me? And I think to myself, from age 16 to 63, this has been similar with my life. Will I follow the Lord? And I say to you, you're loved. You're loved by God. I think His invitation to Moses and to myself is the same as His invitation to you. Will you follow you are loved. You are known by your Creator. I'd like to pray and then allow our team to close us with a worship song. I'm so thankful that you know me and still love me, Lord. You know everything about me. And you love me. This is... This is amazing, Lord. It's, it's almost too much to comprehend. But I thank You. And I ask for Your help personally. And I ask that You would give help to my friends here who want to follow You. Lord, we need help just to step out of that place of authority. Step off the throne of the life You've given us to follow. We need Your help in that. And we know that You'll give it to us. Help us, Lord. 
Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. Please join us as we sing the, the God Who Stays. I, um, this song talks about God staying with us even though we're not perfect. I know you all are, but you know none of us up here on the stage are perfect. Right, Pastor? We have had failures in our lives. You have had failures in your life. But he's the God who stays with us. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause, because I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair, cause I feel like I'm beyond repair. But somehow you don't see me like I do, somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays, you're the God who stays, you're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world you're the God who stands with wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done but separate my heart from the God who stays. I used to hide every time I thought I'd let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way. But I'm learning you don't work that way. But somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays my shame can't separate my guilt can't separate my past can't separate I'm yours for sin can't separate my scars can't separate my failures can't separate I'm yours forever no enemy can separate no power of hell can take away your love for me will never change I'm yours forever you're the God who stays, you're the God who stays, you're the one who runs in my direction, when the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands, with wide open arms, and you tell me nothing I have ever done, but separate my heart from the God who That's the first time I've ever heard that song. Wow. We'll close with this thought. It's a benediction that God told Moses to have spoken over his people. And since that time, you can find this benediction in the book of Numbers chapter 6. Since this time, it's been spoken over the church in all of its forms that have gathered for thousands of years. 
and this is it. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His pleasing countenance, His face, shine down on you. And may the Lord give to you peace, a sense of wholeness, everything coming together, peace, shalom. May He give you these things. You are beloved of God. Regardless of the voice that rises up within you, or maybe a voice that comes at you from the outside, you are known by God and you are loved by God. Follow Him. He is worth it. Amen? Amen. I hope you have a great week, everybody. The Lord be with you. You're dismissed.